Welcome and thank you for joining us this evening. I'm Kathleen Rourke from Candlewick Press, and I'm delighted to have the honor of introducing the fifth episode in the Black Creator series, Bringing Books to Your Classroom Community, a collaboration between the Teachers College Reading and Writing Project and Candlewick Press, hosted by Sonia Cherry Paul, Director of Diversity and Equity at Teachers College Reading and Writing Project. Tonight, we welcome Kekla Magoon, multiple award-winning author, of many books for young readers, and most recently, the recipient of the American Library Association's prestigious Margaret A. Edwards Award for her significant and lasting contribution to young adult literature. Sonia and Kekla will be able to reply to comments during the presentation, so we invite you to use the comments section to ask questions. Thank you for joining us and enjoy the conversation. So Kekla, how are you? Welcome. Thank you, I'm doing well, it's nice to be here. Thank you. And congratulations on winning the the Margaret Edwards Award. Um, That was just so exciting uh, for for us all to to witness. And you've won several awards, NAACP Image Award, the Boston Globe Horn Award, several Coretta Scott King Honors, the Walter Award, um, and a a host of others. What does it mean to you to have your body of work acknowledged in these ways? It's, 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 it's a tremendous honor. It's really exciting. It's always a pleasure every time, you know, a book is selected by a committee because, you know, my work, I think my work is worthy of awards, but I also know that many people's work is worthy of awards and it's very dependent on the committee and the, the time and the moment. Um, and so, I do everything I can, you know, with my books to have them be of that quality, but to have them be actually selected in that moment um, is a real honor and, you know, probably a little bit of, of luck and good fortune um, in each of those moments. And so I'm very grateful that, that my work has been lifted up in that way um, so many times. And particularly this recent honor, the Margaret A. Edwards Award is, is uh, it landed at a particular moment when, um, you know, I'm struggling with a really challenging book project. And, you know, as, as a writer, you know, so often you're working alone in your home, you know, especially now in this midst of this pandemic, right? It feels like a very isolating, um, type of work. And so it's incredibly exciting and special and uplifting in so many ways to to have the feeling that people out there are reading the work and celebrating the work and sharing the work and using it to advance the conversations that are really important to me about social justice and Black history and, you know, all manner of things relating to identity and, you know, being a Black American. And and so those, those awards just highlight the the importance of, of the work that I feel like I'm doing and um, and I'm incredibly grateful that other people recognize you know the effort that I'm trying to make and and are able to take it further than I can take it you know all I can do is write and so knowing that there are librarians and teachers out there that are carrying the work to young readers is really really powerful well Kekla they are incredibly well deserved honors indeed and I want to talk a little more about about your body of work. Um, and I want to just share the cover of, of one, and that is uh, the season of Sticks Malone. Um, and you know your your work. There's just a lot of breath to it. You you write fiction, realistic fiction like the season of Sticks Malone. You you write adventure books like uh, the Robin Hoodlum series. You've written science fiction, um, and you've also written nonfiction books that address race and racism. Is there a particular genre that pulls at your heart more as a writer? Is there one that feels more important for you to be contributing to right now in this moment? Really, I think that so many of my books pivot and sort of organize around similar ideas um, that the more that I write and the more diverse my body of work appears, the more I'm able to see the threads that connect the different stories. Um, You know, I write a lot about Black history. I write a lot about social justice, both in historical and contemporary contexts. And even when I'm doing fantasy and science fiction, I'm 
weaving those elements in. Um, I've written, you know, sort of about identity in the sense of being a Black American, being a biracial American, being someone who's trying to find her place in the world, trying to find their place in the world. Um, and, and feeling like someone who wants to make a difference and what does that look like and how does that manifest for you know, just a small regular person, right? I, I've written biographies about famous uh, Americans and um, well, famous people around the world. And it, it, it always surprises me sort of when you really look at someone's life, you could, you can, you can look beyond the, you know, sort of exceptional um, achievements that they've had um, to sort of the ordinary life that they're living. And I find that really inspiring and insp and connecting me to you know, sort of my own potential as someone who could make a difference in the world, like seeing the humanity behind these heroes that we celebrate. And, and so for me, all the different types of stories that I write, whether they're nonfiction, fiction, fantasy, <laughs> historical, contemporary, it's all about these similar themes of who am I in the world? How can I make a difference? And what, what does it take for me or for my characters in, in these cases to see the their own ability, their own power, their own potential to hear their own voice echoing in whatever way is important to them. Mm. And so I don't necessarily feel like I have to do that through a particular genre. I think that I'm most known and most celebrated <laughs> for writing historical fiction and writing fiction that's specifically about the Black American experience, which is to say the challenges related to the Black American experience. Um, the My novels, How It Went Down and Light It Up, that are about controversial shootings of black teens um, in a particular community and the community response to that have been some of the books that were honored and and um, and recognized and you know I think that as a black author I think the audience that I'm writing for is often looking for really specific racialized content from black authors um, and likes to celebrate that and so I think that there is value and importance in me doing that um, and I have a, a particularly interesting, I think, perspective um, on those issues and a, and a particular way of bringing them to light that's different from what a lot of other people are doing. And so I enjoy that challenge and that task, but I also feel that there's value in stepping outside of that and doing things that are a little bit surprising, that are not necessarily what you expect from a Black author writing in this context. And so I, I think that all of those things are important. And for me, the there's great power in being able to do a variety of things and, and being allowed to do a variety of things because it isn't always easy to carve, um, to carve that landscape out. Um, so I wanna stay with that question that you asked of, of who am I? Um, and, and just play around with that a little bit in, in our thinking. Um, Beverly Daniels Tatum talks about the complexity of identity and answering that question, who am I? And how who the world says we are um, plays a role in this. So we can think about the images that are reflected back at us in our classrooms and in our schools. And so in, in our younger years as elementary, middle and high school students, let's think about that for a moment, too often um, writing and reading workshops, for me, I'll say, um, felt like identity silencing spaces where I almost felt I needed to check my racial and cultural identity at the door um, and write in ways that was inauthentic and not truly reflective of, of me. And I think there are children who are experiencing that um, around the country. And I'm wondering, did, did you feel like your English language arts classrooms were identity inspiring spaces where you could bring your full self to the page? And if so, what did your teachers do to encourage you in that way? It's, it's funny because I, I uh, recently, got a message from my my fourth grade teacher, Mrs. McClintock, <laughs> who I'm Facebook friends with. Um, and it was after uh, the I had won the Edwards and it was, you know, in a Facebook thread uh, of comments and congratulations. And, you know, it was all very lovely. And she, she wrote something to the effect of, um, you know, oh, I remember how you used to fill your journals, you know. <laughs> <laughs> in fourth grade. Um, and I remember writing back to her and saying, oh, that's so funny because I don't, I don't have a memory of that. Like I don't have a memory of writing as a young child. My mother will tell you as well um, that I wrote a lot and that I was always, you know, 
making up stories in one way or another. <laughs> um, and, and so, you know, and every time she talks about that, I just, I, I don't remember that. I was not a child who grew up wanting to write. It, I didn't um, feel a particular connection to writing. I don't, I don't know that I was um, at that age necessarily looking for a way to, to have voice. Um, I think I started writing, in, in my mind, I started writing <laughs> um, around sixth grade, but even that it was, um, you know, I had a notebook under my pillow and I would, you know, write little things in it that never quite, it was, I was trying to keep a diary and it never quite worked because <laughs> I was trying to, to write stories, I think, but I didn't really know what I was doing. And I was just a lot of fragments and a lot of sort of attempts at poetry and a lot of um, scribbles and a lot of almost like revisionist, you know, here's what happened today and here's how I wish it had gone kind of storytelling. Um, and, and so I, I felt in that time at that age as though I was failing at keeping a diary because I wasn't able to say today I you know did this 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 and this and this, and this. I, I so I remember the feeling of being like I'm trying to keep this diary and it's not working um, and yet I have like mounds of pages right of stuff that I filled you know in, in middle school and high school um, of things that I was writing and fragments and, and pieces of that um, and so I think that the short and unfortunate answer is that I don't think that my school writing spaces were a place where I felt free to be myself. Um, and I don't know that that's, you know, the fault of, you know, my teachers in particular at all. Um, I think it was, it's partly structural. I think it's partly, you know, I grew up in a very, very white and conservative community in Fort Wayne, Indiana. Um, and I was at that time positioned by society, let's just say, <laughs> I was positioned by society um, eh, as someone who should assimilate, right, as opposed to someone who should stand out. And so I think that at that time, and, you know, of course, this is the late 80s, early 90s, when I was in, you know, elementary school, going into middle school and high school. And, you know, I think that at that time, there was a little bit more pressure on kids from diverse backgrounds to try to fit in. I think that was a, a lot of my friends that I went to college with who also have a, you know, a multiracial or um, international, you know, background. My dad is from Cameroon, West Africa. My mom is a white American. Um, it, you know, I think there was pressure on all of us. This is something we used to talk about. I think there's pressure on all of us to you know, not learn the second language to speak at home, to, to be really proficient in English, to be able to fit in, to, um, you know, take advantage of light-skinned privilege, even though we wouldn't have phrased it that way at that time in that moment. Um, and so I think that the things I was doing in the school space were much more performative and less authentic. And my my private writing space um, that was the thing under my pillow, the thing in my mind, the thing that I could play with, um, you know, in the basement with my dolls, making up stories and forcing my brother to help me act them out. <laughs> you know, like those spaces that were private and were were mine, I think that was the place where I felt safer. That was the place where I felt more expressive. And I think that, you know, even still today, that that difference matters to me. The idea that I have this private writing space that I can occupy that nobody else is going to see. And then there's this separate thing that happens when I try to publish a piece of work and take it out into the world. Um, and so I do think that there is a lot I learned um, about writing from all of my, you know, all of my teachers. Um, I'm also you know, often <laughs> run into my middle school and um, high school English teachers at conferences and things like that. Um, so, you know, those are people who I remember and, and classes that I remember and the influence of those spaces is still on me, but I don't, I don't think I reached my full potential in those places. And I think, you know, there's such a lesson here for educators to, to listen to what you're saying that um, you felt that your writing, particularly in elementary school was more performative, less authentic, and, and certainly not identity inspiring. Um, and that you felt that you could be your full self in private spaces. And we know from looking across your work that your racial and cultural identities absolutely influences what and how you write today. So I'm wondering what might you say to teachers, elementary school teachers, we can start there, um, about creating a space where students from um, a wide variety of racial and cultural identities feel that they can bring all of who they are to the page in writing workshops. 
-hmm. What might they do? Uh, well, one of the things I've heard of a teacher doing um, that I thought sounded cool was, you know, they ha she had, uh, I can't remember, she, let's say, um, had uh, the students write um, in a notebook every single day, and she would just look at the pages to make sure there was writing on it, but she wouldn't read what was what had been written. Mm -hmm. um, or like she would have the child show, okay, I wrote today and you would see the, the right, okay. But but there's not an actual um, like critique process that's going on. There's not a, um, a, a sense that, you know, this is a teacher looking over your shoulder. This is your own space and you can write about anything. Um, I, th I think giving the broadest possible prompts, I think giving multiple options when you're giving writing prompts, um, you know, the sort of classic example is like the, what I did on my summer vacation, right? <laughs> like, yeah. you, know, um, you know, could there be other ways of phrasing that? Could there be other um, other options given at the same time so that if a child doesn't have a particular experience to write about, right? The, that's the classic example there is that, you know, 50% of the kids go on a vacation trip and can write about that trip and the other half are like, they're at home. And it's like, well, what did I do on my summer vacation? I sat around my house, you know? <laughs> um, and so there, there's, that doesn't mean you didn't do anything and there's a story to be told about, you know, hanging around your house, um, but it feels different depending on how it's presented. And so I think, mm -hmm. you know, giving a few options, um, you know, what was an interesting thing you did this summer is slightly different, right? Like, or, you know, um, yeah. And I think certainly if it's a classroom that never talks about race and culture and particularly in affirming ways, then the message to students is this isn't the place where I do that, right? Yeah. This is not, the door is not open for, for this kind of, of writing or this part of myself that you were, that you were keeping in private. Um, so I want to talk a little bit about an, another another incredible novel that that middle school, um, especially um, seventh eighth grade teachers, high school teachers, are going to want to make sure that they have um, in their libraries. And certainly, it is one that is thinking a lot about race um, and also racism. And and that is X. So I want to just share um, the cover of this. Um, as I'm as I'm talking about it, and and this is as I said, particularly powerful um, for historical fiction units and and book clubs. Um, it's an incredible non-linear novel that hooks readers in, um, not only because of the content but because of the structure. How did you come to write the story of X with educator, author? Ilyasa Shabazz, who is also Malcolm X's daughter. How did you come to, to, to do this with her? Yeah, well, I was fortunate enough to be invited to do this with her, which is pretty exciting. Uh, as I understand it, her agent presented her with uh, you know, a variety of authors who might be good fits for the project. Um, and she read some of their previous work and selected me, which I mean, at the time I was, just beside myself over <laughs> having been selected um, because it was it was considerably earlier in in my career and that book really helped um, you know helped expand people's awareness of me as an author as well um, it was my fifth novel and um, you know but when she chose me it was my I had only had two novels out um, and the third was about to come out so I, it was the rock and the river that she read that she felt like, oh, the work that I was doing around the Black Panthers, um, who of course were inspired by Malcolm X um, to, to form the program that they did. Um, you know, she, she felt like I was someone who could understand the story she wanted to tell about her father. And of course that was extremely flattering and exciting to me. Um, and then of course there was the intimidating factor of actually having to write this book. <laughs> with Malcolm X's daughter and, you know, um, sort of embody the first person voice of, of teen Malcolm X. But I think it's a really, really powerful narrative. And, and I'm really pleased that she, that she selected me. And I, I felt like I learned a lot from her about the, the core of what it is that I was in some ways already doing, but she had words for it that I didn't have yet about kind of un, undoing this, this narrative about heroes. Um, and the idea that Malcolm was this young kid who didn't understand his potential, didn't know what was going to become of him um, and feared that nothing would become of him. And so he, how he emerged from that space into uh, a place of, of triumph, you know, which of course took many years, 
Um, and, you know, the concept of triumph is complicated because he was ultimately assassinated. But but in terms of like his his personal growth and development and his his ability to be someone, you know, that makes a difference, like that was obviously very successful for him in his life. And 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 to have started as a kid who thought nothing would ever come of his life um, is pretty a pretty powerful narrative. And so I feel like I've used the inspiration from her and from that project to to fuel a lot of other things that I do that are in some ways in the same vein, but through my own lens instead of through Ilyasa's lens. Yeah. Wow. I want to think more with you about undoing these narratives about heroes and also narratives about Black history, right? Because as you mentioned, um, when you look across your body of work, the thread that is absolutely there is an emphasis on the importance of, of knowing Black history, which is American history, um, the importance of understanding how injustice works, and the power within oneself and, and community. And so in The Rock and the River, you do write about 13-year-old um, Sam and a tension between two powerful Black movements in history, the Civil Rights Movement and the Black Panther Party. And there's a tendency to characterize, to build the narrative around them in ways that glorify the Civil Rights Movement and vilify the Black Panther Party movement. Um, what do you hope readers will come away with about, about both movements as they read The Rock and the River and ways Black people organized strategically to fight for equality and the pattern we can notice that demonstrates how dominant forces, particularly leadership in the government, responds to these movements? I think your point is well taken that that what what we what we tend to present about this movement is you know oh, yay peace holding hands brotherhood you know civil rights we shall overcome like you know everybody linked arms and sang and marched across a bridge right um, and and we sort of presented in that light and we fail to say they marched across the bridge and then were beaten within an inch of their life we forget <laughs> we forget to tell it's not funny I laugh because it's like we 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 tell that story as if. Um, it is all the March on Washington, right? Like a peaceful assembly of people protesting for their beliefs and ultimately triumphing. And that narrative is very, very flawed because um, it, it ultimately strips power from the movement. The movement was nonviolence in the face of incredible life-threatening violence happening on a daily basis to hundreds of people. And when we erase that second half of the equation, <laughs> um, the, 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 that movement of nonviolence loses power and it, and it, it seems... Um, a lot more sanitized and a lot more palatable and a lot more, a lot of things, but uh, mainly simpler. Um, you know, people used to, black people used to be treated badly. There was a movement, a protest movement peacefully, you know, that, that let everybody know that this was unjust and right. then the world changed, right? That's far too simplistic and also completely untrue. The world has not changed sufficiently. It has changed some, but it has not changed sufficiently. And so um, when, you introduce the idea of the Black Panther Party and the, the sense that, you know, we, the Black community are going to rise up in self-defense with arms, which is to say guns, as well as other strategic methods of liberation, such as organizing within the community to yeah. feed people, to clothe people, to house people, to, um, you know, organize union efforts, right? To ensure fair wages, all manner of things across society the Panthers were working on. The Civil Rights Movement was also working on those things, right? But we don't talk about that either. Um, we don't talk about the systemic change that was actually underway in both sides of the movement. And when we forget to talk about that violence piece, right, mm -hmm. nonviolence in response to extreme violence, mm -hmm. it seems very strange that there is a self-defense movement that rises up, right? It's very easy to paint the Panthers as wanting to enact violence when actually they wanted to protect the Black community against the violence that was being enacted upon them day by day. Yeah. And so that, that narrative, <laughs> um, mm -hmm. I believe needs to be corrected. Um, mm -hmm. The way that we tell history, just, you know, on a casual basis across our society, and particularly in the way that we teach this history to young readers um, and young students, because that's how we will change the way that people, broadly speaking, understand this movement if we start young in teaching people the correct narratives. And so I do hope that books like The Rock and the River, which is, you know, for a middle grade audience, so you could read it from from even as early as fifth or sixth grade, but it's really kind of a seventh, eighth grade text, I would say, um, or, or older, um, you know, 
to introduce the Black Panther movement at that age, to introduce the complexity of what it meant to be someone who marched for civil rights. I grew up believing, of course I would have marched with Dr. King. Who wouldn't have done that? A lot of people didn't because it was scary. It was dangerous. You might've been arrested. You might've been killed. And we don't really think that through. Yeah. And in addition to the rock and the river and, and what you said about that narrative, that canned narrative about the Black Panther Party needing to be corrected. You've also written Fire in the Streets, which is another um, essential YA novel educators about the Black Panther Party. Um, What are you noticing about the books or lack thereof available to the young people about the Black Panther Party? And, And is it an intentional approach of yours to write stories with this movement at the center? Are you actively working, intentionally working to correct this narrative? You've got two um, books so far about the Black Panther Party. Might there be more? (laughs) <laughs> there might indeed. Uh, yes. So the, the short answer to your question is yes, it is intentional on my part to bring the history of the Black Panther Party to young readers in a variety of ways. So I have done it through fiction. That was the initial lens because that's what felt best to me. I grew up not knowing much about the Black Panther Party at all. And what I did know was very, very um, flat and very stereotypical and frankly incorrect. <laughs> mm-hmm. um, and, and so I hadn't spent a lot of time paying attention to them. And when I found out that they ran a free breakfast program for school children, I thought that doesn't sound like the Panthers I understand. And then I thought, well, you know, I don't really understand the Panthers. Let me find out more about them. And so in the course of doing that, in the course of learning about the Panthers myself as a 20 something black woman, <laughs> I became honestly enraged that I was able to be taught about the civil rights movement for my entire childhood and adolescence and college age years and not have been really taught and really yep. able to absorb um, the truth about the Black Panther Party and, and that information. And so it became really important to me to use the work that I was doing um, in writing for young readers to, to, to help make sure that doesn't happen to this next generation. And so that's how The Rock and the River came about because um, I wanted to tell that story and I wanted to explore you know, my own relationship to the civil rights movement because I had thought it was one thing. And then when I learned more about the Panthers, I thought, oh, what if I would have been a Panther? And so for me, fiction was a, a really great lens to explore that question of who I would have been in that time and place. Mm -hmm. Um, And so writing The Rock and the River, writing Fire in the Streets, which are companion novels about teens in Chicago, um, exploring the Black Panther Party. Um, I began at that time researching a nonfiction book about the Black Panthers because, you know, schools and libraries started (laughs) shelving the Black Panther novels and teaching the Black Panther novels. And, you know, people kept writing to me saying, well, where, what nonfiction should I go to for mm-hmm. the Black Panther history? And there really wasn't anything. Mm-hmm. Um, there were a lot of uh, scholarly adult books. There were a lot of um, biographies and a few things like that, but it wasn't teen friendly. It wasn't kid friendly at all. I mean, it was barely me friendly. <laughs> I slogged through these, these books, uh, many of which I love, but they're, they're a tough read. And if the goal is to, you know, have a broad audience, that's not what's going to happen with most of those books um, for teens. Yeah. And so I've been working on that project and it is going to come out in September from Candlewick Press. It is called Revolution in Our Time, The Black Panther Party's Promise to the People. And it is a very large book with a very beautiful cover that I hope we'll be able to reveal very, very soon. Mm-hmm. Um, so we're, we're setting that up now um, to reveal the cover uh, and have the book wow. come out in, in September. So there will be a history of the Black Panthers <laughs> that is yeah. written for the young audience and it contextualizes their movement in Black American history, or I should say American history as told through the lens of Blackness. Mm-hmm. And then, um, you know, in relationship to the movements that are perhaps burgeoning today with young people at the helm, so. Wow. That's fantastic Um, because, you know, there is a gap in children's literature and you know what, I'm going to call it a a huge gaping hole. It's, 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 it's just so wide Um, when it comes to some of the histories and, and, and key figures of of Black people. Um, A few months ago, a new book came out about Ida B. Wells Barnett by Michelle Duster, um, who is Wells Barnett's great-granddaughter. And I'm so excited um, to read this book. I can't wait. But I keep wondering, where are the books about Ida B. Wells Barnett for younger readers? Where are the picture books and the chapter books about her? Um, What's clear um, is when we think about books for young readers is that 
the stories of revolutionaries like Ida B. Wells Barnett and Malcolm X and Angela Davis, Fred Hampton, Stokely Carmichael and others, they're simply missing. They're just not there. Um, as if a decision, and, and, I, and we can say that this is not by accident, right? The, the decision has been made that, that these revolutionaries are too radical and not appropriate for young readers. And I can't understand how publishers and educators can subscribe to this, especially now when young children are watching and hearing the news um, about black men and women being killed at the hands of, of police, when their names have become hashtags that are flooding social media and their images are on buildings and murals all around them. So what is it going to take to have more picture books about these revolutionaries? Um, what will it take to revolutionize the publishing industry so that there's just a flood of these resources for teachers and a sea of books for our youngest readers to learn about um, Black revolutionaries, racism and anti-racism. Shirley Kekla, you have the answer to this question. <laughs> I, have, I, have, I have manuscripts for you. <laughs> um, uh, I mean, I have, I have been, uh, now that I've, I've started publishing, um, you know, picture book biographies, I do have a very, very long list of subjects that I would love to see picture book biographies of, including many of the people that you mentioned. Mm -hmm. um, I think that I, since you asked two questions, one is like, what does it take to get picture books? I think that the challenge with picture books specifically is, is just straight up nuance. I think that, um, that, that, uh, you know, a picture book biography can be so many things. It does not have to be limiting, um, but I think that publishing expects them to be a particular way. And I think a, a particular way in terms of like, you know, the, the black narrative that we want to perpetuate. And I don't, I don't mean that as like, I am the we, I'm saying we as a society seem to want to perpetuate. Um, you know, there are particular stories that fit better within that. Um, you know, a lot of narratives of individual black achievement, right? Um, uh, we get those kind of picture books, yeah. um, which again plays into the sort of hero narrative. Um, we don't get as much about movements. We really don't. Um, there are a few uh, exceptions, you know, like the uh, beautiful um, Fannie Lou Hamer book. Um, mm -hmm. you know, there's there there are there are several several notable sort of exceptions. Um, but yeah, I think there are a lot of um, lesser known to the broad you know, the broad world, <laughs> um, there are some lesser known activists that would make exceptional um, subjects for picture book biography. And, and I, I intend to explore some of them unless other people get there first. Um, <laughs> it, maybe other people are already trying. It's, it's very likely that other people are already trying um, and, and unable to break through because of the systemic barriers that you're talking about. Um, mm -hmm. And so your other question was, what does it take to move <laughs> publishing to to open the doors to those stories and to those of us who want to write those stories? I, I mean, I think it takes an act of will. Yes, on the part of the powers that be to step outside of their comfort zone to mm -hmm. allow stories to to uh, come to the marketplace that they may not understand <laughs> yep. and may not resonate with them. I think it's it's ultimately a process of decolonization because yep. there is a mindset about what we expect from black books and we have to undo that mindset person by person and book by book and be able to think beyond the expectation. Mm -hmm. um, yeah, and, and, and as you said, it's all, there's, it's systemic. So, and what we also need are more black people in publishing more black people at the table um, when acquisitions are coming through because we can't keep saying that we want our, our students to learn about what it means to be anti-racist. And yet we have this limited amount of books um, about a limited amount of uh, uh, black revolutionaries which contributes to the limited and comfortable ways that we teach about black people and racism, even after hidden figures, right? When the industry finally decided, hey, you know, maybe it's a good idea to, to talk about Katherine Johnson and Mary Jackson and um, Dorothy Vaughn. We still have limited resources about these women. Um, and those that exist tend to be for, for older readers, uh, middle grade and, and high school. So it's, it's essential that we're all asking the question, why does this silence exist for younger readers? Um, and, with, and with such limited resources and narratives, um, it makes it more challenging for educators to expand 
that those canned narratives that are taught in schools about black history. Um, and in speaking about books for younger readers, let's talk about this book, this new book of yours that you have gifted us with, The Highest Tribute, um, Thurgood Marshall's Life, Leadership, and Legacy. It is gorgeous. It is illustrated by Laura Freeman. Um, what felt compelling to you about making um, this picture book about the life and work of Thurgood accessible to, to younger readers. And I'm gonna flip through some, some, some of the pages as you talk about um, yeah. this, beautiful, yeah. Beautifully illustrated, I was delighted. I was delighted to see the illustrations. It's the first picture book I've done, and so, or the first picture book I've published, I should say. And so it, um, it was really exciting to see the work come to life in this way, which is wildly different from a novel where you get, you know, you get the cover art, but, that, yeah. <laughs> um, but that's it. Like, so to actually see page by page, it was just, it was delightful. Um, <clears throat> I love what she's done with some of the texture of um, oh my goodness words, words as sort of the backdrop of things and it's yes. really, um, so so shockingly <laughs> when I signed this book um, there wasn't a comparable Thurgood Marshall picture book biography in existence <laughs> which sounds actually unbelievable because he very much fits into the narrative like the traditional narrative that we love about the civil rights movement like we society love about the civil rights movement um so I was shocked by that there were some um chapter books and there were um a few like you know part of a series kind of for school library um books at that time um there has since been another book um since since I started working on this project um the a book by Jonah Winter um, called Thurgood is out as well um mm -hmm. very different in style than this book which I think is fun like I think great to have multiple picture books about the same person because you, you it's so like they're so reductive in in many ways right like you have to you have to boil it down you have to find your own thread and there's like would have been a dozen ways to do that and so you know mm -hmm. for me I think that's interesting to have there be a dozen picture books about Thurgood Marshall the publishing industry does not agree but you know <laughs> we'll work on it <laughs> they're cool with you know a dozen picture book biographies of you know well let's say white people <laughs> yeah, yeah. <laughs> right Thomas um, Jefferson, so, Abraham Lincoln, yes. dozens and dozens. And I've written an Abraham Lincoln book, right? Like there's so much, so much out there if you're looking for those people. Um, but so, so I was, I was pleased to see multiple books um, and I hope that more will be written and that they will be read, you know, in many places and, you know, together and, and discussed and, and such. Um, but, you know, so for me, that was shocking. And I was like, well, of course, like I will, <laughs> I will write a picture book biography of Thurgood Marshall because there has to be one, you know? Right. Um, and so that was like sort of the initial impetus. Um, and then, you know, for me, the sort of personal connection comes in with, you know, trying to, you know, again, kind of take apart this idea that this is a, this is a hero who wrote in, you know, he wrote into the Supreme Court and changed the law and he was like sort of heroic and solitary, right? Um, and, you know, in, and in some ways he was those things, but he also, um, you know, was someone who started as a child <laughs> with a goal, with a dream, you know, he went to school, he studied, he worked hard, he was on the debate team, right? There was a lot of, he didn't just, you know, magically appear before the Supreme Court one day arguing Brown v. Board of Education. He spent years building the skill set necessary to do that and building the cases that would ultimately manifest in, you know, overturning segregation. And that was a process. It was a process that involved a team of people that he was working with, his colleagues, his mentors, his family, um, and so I really like the idea of telling his story um, a little bit differently where, you know, I'm not holding him, I am holding him up as a hero, but I'm holding him up as a hero among a group of people who were doing something heroic together. Mm -hmm. um, and I think that that's really powerful to think about, um, you know, him not working alone and that he needed all these other people because, you know, even if I don't see myself as, you know, Thurgood Marshall arguing in front of the Supreme Court, I can see myself as, you know, the law clerk who scurried around behind him, like <laughs> bringing up the cases that he needed. And it's like that person's work was just as important to the success of Brown v. Board of Education as like the actual or, or oral arguments that Thurgood made in front of the court. Mm -hmm. And so, so the idea that there's this whole network of people working together is something I tried to put into, into the book. Um, yeah. And the feeling that, that you know, we, we all have the ability in us to, to do something remarkable, even if it's not so remarkable that we get a biography written about us, like we can mm -hmm. be part of making history in that same way. 
Well, you certainly accomplished that in this. It's it's so beautiful and powerful. And so educators, if um, you want to have this book um, in your classroom and on your shelves, um, it's such a great book for kids to just read and learn about American history um, through the lens of Black people um, and also important for biography units and even kids who are writing biographies um, can em emulate your writing style in this book. I love the way you start with a little story um, about Thurgood that, that becomes like almost a metaphor for, for him um, in his later life. And I won't, I won't give that away because folks should, should get the book and they should read that. Um, so, so Kekel, what's next for you? Um, you talked about the Black Panther Party nonfiction book um, is on the way and hopefully we'll get a, a chance at seeing the cover soon. Um, what new projects, uh, other new projects are you working on that, that readers can look forward to? Um, well, I do, I do indeed have um, picture book biographies that are under contract. So I'm working, um, working on those and um, I have a uh, novel that I just turned in a revision um, to my editor, um, the same editor that worked on Sticks Malone. Um, so that that's in progress. That one is supposed to be coming out in the summer of 22. Um, and then, yeah, the Black Panther nonfiction. So that's Revolution in Our Time and that's due out in September, end of September this year. And I'm also collaborating on a graphic novel series with Cynthia Lydic smith uh, and Blue Stars series. And so the first book of that is due out in fall of 22. And that is such a fun project. Oh, so, great. So, so much excitement. We have, yeah, we have a lot of fun, fun with our, our little superhero duo. <laughs> wow. <laughs> yeah, that's amazing. Fun. That's amazing and exciting. Um, Kekla, in, in the highest tribute, Thurgood Marshall's life, leadership, and legacy, you quote Thurgood himself in the beginning and you write, in recognizing the humanity of our fellow beings, we pay ourselves the highest tribute. And an enduring part of your legacy, Kekla, is the way that you've paid the highest tribute to black people in your work and in turn to black children who because of you have mirrors that reflect black genius. And so I want to ask, what does it mean to you to be a Black creator? Oh, I mean, I love this question, but it's also, um, it's sort of one of those questions that's like asking a fish to describe the water, you know, right? It's like, what is air? What is light? <laughs> you know, um, there is a technical, you know, or scientific answer to those things. Um, but there's also an element of wonder, you know, a kind of inexplicability. Um, there's something life-giving there. It's beyond understanding, I think. Um, it's always been a part of me, even though I don't remember my earliest <laughs> creative bursts. Um, I think it's always been a part of me. And, and so um, to define it um, is, you know, if I could define it easily, I probably wouldn't need to write novels, you know what I mean? <laughs> <laughs> um, because it's, it's that sort of existential contemplation. Um, I think like many other identities, being a black creator is something to be grappled with. I think it's something that defines me, um, defines a person, um, but it's also something that you get to define for yourself. And I feel like I get to define it for myself, which is what you're asking. <laughs> so I'll say um, for me, um, creating through writing, it, it's a way of having voice in the world. Um, it's a way of speaking and a way of hopefully being heard and having the opportunity to influence thought and the human experience and, you know, other lofty things like that, um, you know, and that's taking it to the extreme. But I think particularly in writing for a young audience, it feels like a responsibility and a privilege to, to have that identity and essentially to be part of helping other people form their own identities. Because um, the books that we read at that really young age have an impact like no others that we'll read, you know, in our lifetime. Um, so I see it as a very serious and weighty task um, to be a Black creator. And I see that identity as something to be worn with reverence and, um, and carefully nurtured by the best parts of who I am. Um, and I would choose to define it as expansively as possible because I think it's also about pushing boundaries and defying expectations reclaiming space and constantly reminding the world that we will not be denied. We will be heard and we will be remembered. Thank you, Kekla. It's been wonderful talking to you.
Thank you. It's wonderful talking to you. Thank you for inviting me. Thank you both so much for this incredibly valuable and thoughtful dialogue. You've provided educators with so many ideas, perspectives, and truths to inform and enrich their teaching. And thank you for that. Please join us in April for the next conversation in the Black Creators series. Our guest will be poet Sophia Thacker, whose powerful debut, Somebody Give This Heart a Pen, brings her spoken word performance to the page. For a full schedule of conversations and links to an accompanying podcast, please visit blackcreatorseries.candlewick.com and check the Teachers College Reading and Writing Project's Facebook page for past episodes. Thank you for joining us. Thank you.